Good evening, everyone. We continue this narrative of the battle between、uh, Saul and against the Philistines, and we have seen how incredibly large the Philistines' army, as it came in to reinforce the the troops that were already inside the land of Israel. They came with thirty thousand. Uh, chariots, six thousand、uh, on horses,、uh, and then they have innumerable number of troops. They were stationed at Mikmash,、uh, right across from where、uh, Gevi'ah, or the hill of the 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 Benjamin Hills,、uh, are. And Saul was stationed there with just six hundred men. We were also told at the end of chapter thirteen that the men who were fighting, the six hundred of them, had no swords or spears, but they had agricultural equipment, things like axes and pitchforks, things which they were using for、uh, shepherding and for agriculture and for plowing, and only Jonathan and Saul had swords and spears. Now, with that in mind, we enter into chapter fourteen, verse one. Now, the day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who was carrying his armor, and this is the armor bearer. Now, in those days, the the、um, the chieftains who went for war had protection, and armors are very heavy, and so you had a person carrying his armor. And this was what Jonathan suggested: "Come, let us cross over to the Philistines' garrison or the ban that is on the other side." Now, the interesting thing in verse one is that he did not tell his father. Now, what we are seeing here is that Jonathan is taking things into his own hands and he is leading the charge. And the other interesting thing is, it's only two of them, versus the large number of Philistines. Verse two. Saul was staying in the outskirts of、uh, Giva'ah. Now, Giva'ah is also a name for hill, and. Where they all are 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 very hilly places in the land of Benjamin, under the pomegranate tree, which is in、uh, Migron. Now, the pomegranate tree is a fairly large tree, and I suppose you can get some shade from it. And the people who were with him were about six hundred men. Now, this number is six hundred, literally six hundred. Out of three thousand that were there, and、uh, so we have two thousand four hundred that had ran away when they saw the thirty thousand chariots that came from the Philistines. Now, from verse two onwards, we have what we call sidebars, you know, information to fill in the blanks before the narrative continues. So we go to verse three. In verse three. It reads Ahia. Ahia is the son of Achitov, and he is Ikavot's brother.、Uh, and who is Ikavot's brother? He is the son of Pinchas,、uh, the son of Eli. Now remember. Eli was the priest of the Lord at Shiloh, and Achiah, and and they were all priests, right? They are not just Levites; they are priests. So the son of Levi is Pinchas, and the son of Pinchas is Ichabod, right? Ichabod's brother,、uh, Ahituf. And Ahiah is the son of Ahituf. Basically. This gives us a background that Achia is the priest of this time, 
and he was wearing an effort. Now the effort really is the garment uh, for the high priest, and he seems to be wearing one. And with the effort, you would see something which is more important, which is the urim and tumim. These are all decision stones. And they use this to make decisions to see where God would cast his lots. And what is more important is not the effort, but what is in the effort pouches. The people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Now, all these are background information. Verse 4, And between the passes which Jonathan sought to cross over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp crag on one side and a sharp crag on the other side. The name of one was Botsets, and the name of the other was Sene. Now, what does this mean? Now, let me just redraw some of the pictures which we tried to draw yesterday. We have Mikmash. And then we have Giva'ah, right? Giba'ah, Giva'ah. That's the hill, right? This is the hill. And Mikmash was also the hill. And what I think there is, it, that it's there appears to be all these are hills, right? All these are hills. And that could be a very... Uh, I would say a, a, a sharp crevice or a valley on one side and then one more on the other side. And so we would find that one of them is called uh, Bodzets. Now, whether this is Bodzets or not, let's see. Yeah? Um, this, is, this could be called Bodzets, and this one could be Sene. Basically, these are two. It, it's a it's a valley between two uh, huge hill terrain. Like that. That's basically what it, it what it means, and that's why it's called a uh, a sharp crag. The the word crag. Um, how should we say? Um, they call it the tooth of the rock. Uh, and, and, and very much so that they are just uh, a, a pass between two huge rocks, which, which would mean two, two hills, right? Two hills. Because the hills there are all rocks, right? Big rocks. We are still in the background information. The crack rose from the north opposite Mikmash and the other on the south opposite Geva. And so what we have is that Saul and the Philistines were across of each other, but there is these, these um, narrow pathways that is in between two high rocky points. Verse 6, Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, notice this is just Jonathan and the armor bearer, two of them, and they are going to cross over to the Philistines. So come, let us cross over to the, the, the band of troops, the band of troops where they are guarding, and they are called the uncircumcised. Uh, the word is very clear here. Uh, they are uncircumcised, right? Because they are not Hebrew. They are not Hebrew. Now, look at the words in verse 6. It says here, perhaps. Perhaps literally means um, 
if if God permits, I think this would be a a, a good way of expressing. If God permits, then the Lord will work for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or few. Restrained here means hindered. Right? Hindered. Held back. And so it's interesting to observe uh, how well Jonathan knows God. And so his point is this. The two of them are going to cross over to the garrison of the Philistines and encounter them. And they are also called the uncircumcised. Now, what is important is this text here. This text here is, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or few. Now, his idea is this. If God were to save, it doesn't matter whether there are two of them or there are 20,000 of them. That is what Jonathan is saying. There are only two anyways. And obviously, if they were so certain, they wouldn't have said perhaps. Now, this word here is important because they are waiting on God to see whether God will act on their behalf. Now, this is the, the situation right now as they prepare to cross over to the garrison or to the band, to where the Philistines' troops are gathered. In verse 7, we find that his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Turn yourself. Here I am with you according to your desire. And let me just break this down a little bit. It says, the armor bearer says to him, that do everything in your heart. Now understand, heart is not about desire. Heart is the mind. And the mind is to make decisions. And so basically the armor bearer said, whatever you decide, go. And, and the idea here is turn yourself. Well, the turn yourself is just, uh, I would say, uh, go for it, right? Go do it. And the armor bearer is saying this, here I am with you. This word with you is together according to your desire. Now, this word here needs a bit of explaining. Explaining. This is according to your heart. That is in the Hebrew. Now, we have a situation here that your desire, your heart, they are all the same word. And it is difficult then, if we were just to read the English, to know that it's, it's talking about the same thing. And so I just want to point out to you that, yes, it is talking about the same thing. It's talking about the decisions that Jonathan wants to do. And the armor bearer says, whatever your heart decides. And so I think desire may not be such an accurate word. Uh, I think decision would be. And yet you would now see one Hebrew word being translated using two English words and two very different English words. And so if we are just reading the English, oftentimes we may get caught in some of these situations. Obviously, you also know this is one Hebrew word many English words, right? Verse 8, then Jonathan said, now this is how they determine whether God is going to be with them or not. 
He says, behold, look, or look here. He says, we will cross over to the men and we are going to reveal ourselves, right? Be exposed, basically. We're going to be exposed to them. What does that mean? It means that uh, Jonathan and the armor bearer are going to show themselves to the Philistines. Now, if you think a little bit about it, this seems to be a bit um, well, I guess a bit naive, two men going against the entire uh, troop of the Philistines. But this is what he's saying. He is saying that if they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. Now, this is part one. Part one. What it means is, if they are crossing, they are crossing and they are telling the men, the Philistines, and if the Philistines reply to them, one, wait. Then they will wait and not proceed. But if they say, this is the second point that Jonathan is making come up to us then we will go up for the Lord has given them into our hands and this shall be the sign to us and we need to break this down the second one is go to them right go up to them and so in number two if number two happens then we will go up. We will go up. We will ascend. Where are they? Well, if you recall, they are in Mikmash. On top of a hill. And they were going to go up to them. And go up means both Jonathan and the uh, Armor bearer has to go up the hill to them and not for them to come down to Jonathan. Now, the second point I wanted to make to you is that it seems that he is of the understanding that if this is said, then the Lord has given them into our hands. The battle is won. We just have to fight and they will lose. And this shall be the sign to us. Now the word sign is something very visible, something that can be seen. It is not superstition here, right? Superstition would be something that you guess, but this would be something very specific, including the words that are being said. And how it's been said. So, is it wait or is it go up? If, if they say go up to them, then it is done. God is with them and they have nothing to worry about. Now, that is how Jonathan is looking at this picture and how the two of them had so much courage to go and face the Philistines. And, and I suppose you could now begin to see that this is a foreshadow of how well uh, both Jonathan and David knows God. And he, Jonathan comes at this point in time uh, to be able to face their enemy by looking at God and whether God will give them into their hands. Now, the word give them into their hands is very similar to the time when Moses on the eastern side of the Jordan 
brought the Israelites uh, to King Sihon and took them down because God gave them to into the hands of the Israelites. So the idea of giving means they now have the ability to win over their enemies. And they went further up. King Og in the Golan Heights, they, he was also defeated with walled cities. So the idea of give means something very precious to the Israelites because God would have paved the way and would not stop them from taking over these people. Verse 11, when both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, the Philistines said, and look at what is said, behold, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. And this is well known, actually. When the 30,000 chariots and the 6,000 horse riders came with innumerable number of troops, the Hebrews or the Israelites ran for their lives, went to hide everywhere. And so now that they see two, two Hebrews, they said that, wow. These Hebrews have come out from the holes. The holes are all their hiding places, caves, right? These are their hiding place to hide from the Philistines. So this is essentially, they are, they are mocking, they are mocking the Hebrews. They are also scared. When the Philistines come, everybody runs away to hide. Verse 12, so the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer. Uh, well, the word here uh, actually means to answer or to respond, right? Not hail. And he says, come up to us. And we will tell you something. And so they're trying to trick Jonathan and the armor bearer to go up to the hill where they are. And they want to tell them something. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. And notice Jonathan is not talking about himself as an individual when he fights the war. He is fighting on behalf of the nation. On behalf of the nation. So this one says, come up after me. The word after me is behind. Come up behind me. And so both of them will climb up the hill. Jonathan in front, armor bearer at the back. Verse 13. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet. It's a big climb with his armor bearer behind him. No, this is the same word behind him. The next phrase is important then. The next phrase is what we call a, a narrative uh, sequence. This is and then. Right? And then they fell. Now the word uh, fall uh, literally means fall down uh, or die, right? Or slain. Now these are good words to use. Before Jonathan and his armor bearer and put some to death after him. And so you have slain struck, they fall down, many die, right? Uh, some were injured. Now that would be verse 13, verse 13. Now verse 14 continues, after the first slaughter uh, I think we could read this after the first blow. 
because that would be the first of the strikes by the Israelites, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, was about 20 men. That's all. And this is within about half a furrow in an acre of land. Now, this would be uh, a bit difficult for us to translate, but let me just give you the idea. It is giving us uh, a time, right? How long it took to kill 20 men. And the time is the time it takes for a man to plow to plow a furrow right to plow a furrow and a furrow would be whatever is in between the mounds right and this would be the time it takes an animal and a person to plow and this one says about the span of a field or half a span of the field. Half. And so they didn't actually measure it in you know, seconds and minutes, but they measure it based on the general time it takes for a person to plow for a half span of the, the, the land. Now the English inserts the word acre. We don't know whether it's acre, but we do know that it is a fair size of land that the ox will need to uh, plow. Carrying on into verse 15, and there was a trembling in the camp. Now this word trembling is generally used uh, uh, on men with regards to God, but trembling here means fear. Uh, what else is there? Um, exceeding fear, being anxious. But I just want to point out to you that this part in this verse literally tells us that there is something happening that they were very afraid they were very afraid now how did that happen and i think that is something supernatural right that is something supernatural everybody was afraid the garrison the band of uh, troops and the raiders that came because the earth quaked so that it became a great trembling and this trembling is also the same trembling as this point here. Tremble, trembling. And so they were afraid because of a supernatural intervention. And so Although there was a sign that Jonathan understood, but here when they, they went out to fight, God was with them because the earth also rocked. And when you're up on the hill, an earthquake is not a very enjoyable time because you don't know when the hill is going to crack. And so there was great fear and anxiousness in the camp. Everybody was panicking because when the earth started to shake, and it's something that they are not used to, and having the earth shake had scared them, it caused great confusion. Great confusion amongst the people. These are the enemies of the Israelites. Verse 16, it says, Now Saul's watchmen in Giva'ah of Benjamin, that's a hill in Benjamin, they looked and behold, the multitude melted away. Now, what does that mean? The multitude melted away really means they, they were 
they were destroyed. I guess you can say that. So they looked and behold, the multitude melted away. Literally means uh, they were destroyed. They were destroyed. How were they destroyed? It was God's work, right? That shook the earth. And so the commotion, the commotion, the roar, the multitude fainted. They were, how should we say? They were, they made, uh, they made, a roar. They didn't know what to do. They were confused. They were anxious. Uh, yeah, I guess we could use the, these words. Uh, and the next word is to be dissolved, I guess, to be melted away. Uh, vi virtually melting. What does that mean? It means that they have seen how God works and they are so scared and that their legs are wobbly. And that is what it means by melting away. They didn't know what to do. They were totally confused. And the description here is they went here and, right? Uh, the idea is they, they were walking everywhere they were in a disarray and that is how Jonathan could see that God was with them it's not just the words that were said but literally believing that God will save them verse 17 now we come back to the narrative of verse 1 Saul said to the people who were with him Number now and see who has gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer was not there. They started to count. Right? And Jonathan and armor bearer was missing. Well, in our understanding, his, they're not missing. They just went ahead to give them the first blow. Give them the first blow. Verse 18. Then Saul said to Ahia, Ahia was the priest. He says, Bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God was at the time with the sons of Israel. And the last we saw where the ark was, uh, was in Kiryat Yaraim. Yarim, sorry. That's where the Ark of God was. Well, I guess we say it was parked there. Right? It was parked there. Verse 19. And while Saul talked to the priests, the commotion in the camp of Philistines continued and increased. So the, Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Let us go. And so what they are saying is that the confusion. God made them confused. And in their confusion, they thought that they had a lot of people with them, but they didn't. Verse 20. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was great confusion. This is, I, like I said, a supernatural event. A supernatural event. Where did the confusion come from? Where did the uh, the, the the ability to to win over the Philistines come from? Now the Hebrews who were with the Philistines, who were with the Philistines previously, who went up to meet them all around in the camp, they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul. There were some Philistines that fought with the Israelites. So I don't think we can say that all Philistines are bad. But we do have 
the axiom all um, all Hebrews are the ones who, who who follow or keep God's command and God says I will protect you and so the Hebrews who were there uh, they 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 actually lined up some of them right actually lined up with Saul and Jonathan 22 to 24. 22 and 23 will be our last verses for today. So let's break this down. It says, And all the men of Israel who had killed, who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines had fled. Even they also pursued them closely in battle. These are the men who had ran away after seeing 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and an innumerable number of troops. They are the same men that was trying to defend themselves, but they couldn't. And now all the men of Israel who were hiding themselves, they're all coming out of the woodwork. And that incident uh, at Michmash, is seen to be this way. It is seen that the Lord delivered Israel that day and the battle spread beyond that event. The idea that's been conveyed here is that we have Mi'kmaq and then we have Givion. What essentially they did was they ran away to bet Aven. And they, that's where they're going. They're running all over the place, confused. And so we had, I guess we had Jonathan who went this way. And then we have Saul come this way. And the Philistines were fleeing, were fleeing. Now, this whole idea of fleeing means uh, they're going to escape. So even though they had uh, 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 and the, the, the battle took place with a very unbalanced number, they never really lifted a finger until now that they are going to chase the Philistines away. And so it is said in verse 23, that God had saved Israel on that day. And the bread, the battle spread beyond Beth Aven. Now, into this narrative, we are seeing that just a recap, 600 strong army. Uh, there is the two of them, uh, Jonathan and the armor bearer, going ahead to provide the Saul battalion the first blow. And now God intervened. Now, this is something which we have to be able to see. God intervened by his words. God intervened into the minds of the Philistines that they were, they were, they were confused. They, they didn't know what to do. And this must be a, I would say, dedicated, supernatural intervention uh, onto the, the sons of the Philistines. Now with that, uh, we should have a fairly good idea before we get into the second part next week as we proceed on with what happened to the Philistines at this time. At this time, because notice 30,000 chariots are running away everywhere, but they are heading back to their land. If they could do that, uh, that would be something that uh, they, they, they must do. The Philistines are now totally confused. Again, you read this in the book of Judges, uh, in, in, in the time of uh, Sisera, uh, how they fought the Israelites at the time of uh, Devorah. Uh, and they were in total disarray. They were totally confused. And that's exactly what happened here again. And they ran away from Mi'kmaq. 
and that is said to be God delivering Israel that day. And it spread it beyond that event. What we can do, a takeaway here is that when they won the battle, they, they acknowledge God's intervention. And by acknowledging God's intervention, we can see that God is in the background, working things that appears in the foreground. And in so doing, we learn that it doesn't matter whether it's two men or 600 men, if God were to save, it didn't matter on the number. And that is how we know for a fact that God is fighting for Israel. And the, the net result until we get into next week is really how appreciative they are of God. And with this, we come to the end of our session tonight.